आई वी एम दिस इज ऑडियो ज्ञान एंड आई एम योर होस्ट केदार निमकर वेलकम टू डीप डाइव इन टू द माइंड ऑफ ल्यूमिनरीज फ्रॉम द इंडियन क्रिएटिव वर्ल्ड वेलकम टू ऑडियो ज्ञान वी आर रिकॉर्डिंग दिस सीरीज वेर आर द डिजाइन हाउस इट्स अ ट्वेल्व पार्ट सीरीज फीचरिंग फ्यू ऑफ द टॉप इन्फ्लुएंशियल डिजाइन लीडर्स इन इंडिया टॉकिंग अबाउट द प्रोसेस ऑफ हायरिंग चैलेंजेस इन फाइंडिंग एंड रिटेनिंग टैलेंट and some tips for young designers to make a cut uh, so i'm happy and proud to announce uh, my co-host for this series abhinit tiwari hey abhinit uh, what's up hey kedar all good how's it going there yeah. good good so we are pretty much close to the end of the season uh, or end of the series and today we have uh, aditi kulkarni with us on audio gan she is a ux manager at shopify previously at indeed referral candy postman and more formally trained in print as graphic designer uh, she switched to web design in early 2005 and has been hiring mentoring and in fact regularly sharing her learnings at various design events and conferences so yeah pretty excited uh, so welcome aditi uh, to audio gan and yeah looking forward to hear your thoughts about where are the designers hi kedar and thanks so much and happy to be here uh, and happy to talk to both of you kedar and abhinit cool cool great Uh, so this series uh, we have introduced like a rapid fire round um, which is sort of like some fun type questions <laughs> before and as we can call it like a warm up round uh, before we get to where are the designers yeah so uh, aditi we'll start with the rapid fire round oh okay so first question is uh, what do you look in a candidate attitude or aptitude attitude okay best way to take notes uh, because you are from print uh, pen and paper or keyboard and ipad and screen that's a difficult question i would say a mix of both or it depends <laughs> sometimes i do prefer pen and paper but sometimes an ipad is very handy so good good your favorite interview question my favorite interview question is can you give me an example of a conflict you've had with a product manager or engineer and how did you resolve it awesome What's more fun, print or web? Web. Okay. <laughs> Did you ever think of going back to print? Because never. <laughs> All right. We will come to that part again. Uh, worst part of print design. I think it just it never sat well with me. To be very honest, I was never able to. The moment I graduated, I was never really able to become a proper print designer. It never happened. Uh, I didn't like book design. magazine design or any of those things um and i immediately i think two projects in i told my boss i want to do website design so i very early switched out say my first job <laughs> so nice. luckily i was working in a design studio and it was easy to just switch to something else so okay uh and which is the what is the worst part of digital design um the worst part i guess um now like today there are a lot of i guess i would say th- there are a lot of ethical concerns like when you build things you have to think about how things would be misused i think in the early days we never really thought about it everyone was very optimistic when the iphone came out and we were making iphone apps and it was all very exciting but today suddenly you know tech does have a bit of a bad name and and so suddenly you're a bit aware of that and you're aware that you could be contributing to some of that and and so i think that is definitely not the not so great part of uh digital design cool cool yaar iske upar bhi ek series kar sakte hain but hard ke later um best book or podcast or recent article that you read in design in design uh not much to be honest i don't read a lot of design books okay then anything else yeah that's great i am actually reading a book about this doctor who is the cause of anti vaxxer propaganda it's very interesting like this british doctor decided that he wanted to come up with this whole concept that vaccinations can cause problems and then that 
that sort of thinking spread all over the world and now all of us are suffering because of it but i think it's very interesting it's very interesting almost like a history and political drama of how that propaganda spread and how people got on board and various institutions got interested in this story and narrative and then how that narrative spread over the years it started decades ago but it's just built steam over the years interesting yeah a uh, tough thing uh, you did as a toughest thing that you did as a design manager i think that's like every day <laughs> um i think being a design manager is really hard uh, i'm i feel like i'm still learning and i face challenges almost every day or every week of my job so yeah cool and uh, what makes like a great designer according to you in one word um i think sincerity okay and uh, one thing you hate about design I don't hate anything about design. <laughs> awesome. That's the rapid fire round. But cool. Uh you want to start with the first one? So, Aditi, I think you touched on this a little, but when you said that, you know, when you graduated you didn't really get a job in print. Could you take us back to that time when you were starting your career? Why or talk a little bit more about why you made the switch from print to Sure. Uh, So I I did my graphic design at NID mm-hmm. and it was awesome fun for four or five years to study design in a design school but then when you graduate and you go out into the real world and you try to practice as a graphic designer it's a completely different completely different universe and I think that's where you get a reality check mm-hmm. that maybe this is not what I want to do So I personally love the craft of logo design and print design and I like to do my own style mm-hmm. um of work right like if you see the postman logo is very geometric and somebody like me is definitely not going to survive in the graphic design industry because I would make logos and you know clients would want a certain particular you know style depending on their brand and that's mm-hmm. fair but i didn't want to do it i was like this doesn't sound fun to me <laughs> so i was i was a young designer and i just wanted to do cool projects sure. and i saw that there was other teams doing web design projects and i was like why can't i do that and it wasn't very popular like people were like sure you want to do that do that and i was like cool and it was quite easy for me to just switch to another project and just start doing web design mm-hmm. and once i started doing it i really loved it and and i was like okay this is definitely what i want to do and that got me started into digital so in my first job itself i never did any like major print projects like i quickly switched i still have that love for branding mm-hmm. and you know print but in a very almost like i would say an arts and craft <laughs> like uh perspective and not in terms of an industry designer who would like you know create all these beautiful images sure. in different different styles uh depending on the client like i think it's a completely different ask from what we were doing in school sure so yeah i i hear that from a lot of designers actually how different industry can be to you know the environment that you have in the college Yeah. yeah and they were you know there were these clients like ceos and stuff who were like oh i want the logo to be you know some other <laughs> color and i was just like excuse me <laughs> like no <laughs> like i'm not going to change the color um but but you kind of had to yep. right cuz they are the client so i found that really frustrating and i was like I'm only going to do logos for like people who actually anyway I started to think that it doesn't make any sense to do this and in in terms of digital I am more I I think I'm more service oriented and I can like figure it out and and be like okay let's come up with the best website for based on your needs and then that was a better match for me yeah it's yeah. much easier with software there's more room to be rational in arguments and you can ask more why is whereas yeah 
Yeah, it's very interesting, right? And then it's it's much better than somebody saying, okay, I'm going to ask my dad which logo is better. And you're like, excuse me, <laughs> like this is so bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's also, I think it's a reflection of the state of the industry at that mm-hmm. time. Like I'm sure the, the graphic design industry is much better now and you can do cooler projects, but I didn't really see that opportunity mm-hmm. when I came out of college. So, so uh, talking about uh, designers and graphic design and digital design, I think my personal opinion is that like titles and roles in designs have kind of gotten out of hand uh, in the last few years. Yeah. So in that way, in, I want to know, like, how do you for yourself define, say, a UI designer or a UX designer or a product designer? Wow, UI, UX. Uh, Sorry, I had to <laughs> ask this, but uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> So I feel like a lot of time has passed uh, in the industry. Like, obviously, when we started, um, no one was doing UX design. And and you started every presentation with the slide saying UX yep. design. What is it? And then you would say UX means user experience. And then you would like explain. Now you don't have to do that anymore. But it's gone the opposite direction where it's almost lost all meaning. And And so I think if you go into the semantics of what does a UI designer mean or what does a UX designer mean or what does a product designer mean? It's, it, there's no real Mm -hmm. difference, you know, in the pure words of it. I think the difference is in the industry and where those kind of titles are placed in companies, right? So let's keep the actual meaning of the word user interface designer or user experience designer or product designer Mm -hmm. to the side my perspective is, I mean, and I'm sure people would have different views on this, is that usually companies hire UI designers to do like execution interface level design. User experience designers can usually do higher levels, more strategic work, and they work either with user interface designers or they are also user interface designers. And then product designers uh, try to differentiate themselves from the UX industry because UX now has this consultancy side to it. And it's very hard to explain to someone that I don't do, you you know, UX consultancy. I'm practicing something Mm -hmm. else and it's very different. And so when you want to tell someone that I don't practice UX in the traditional sense, then you call yourself a product designer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. Obviously, these terms don't really mean anything, but like that's what I think people use it yeah. as yeah. right now. Yeah. What, what do you attribute this mm. uh, lack of a shared definition to, if you will, if you had to pick a reason? Uh, it's just a very growing industry. I think it's great. Like I think, you know, I can only see it as a positive because so many people are joining you know, there are so many people new to the industry who may not understand or not have like all of this context or, you know, not know what it was like 10 mm-hmm. years ago. So people just use the terms like however they want, which is fine. Yeah. Right. So I think as the industry grows and it's a very new industry as well, we have to be very aware that it's very early days there is this confusion and this sort of growing, what I would call growing pains. As more and more designers come into the world now, suddenly people are discussing what's the difference between a UX designer and a product designer. But the fact that people are having that discussion is amazing, right? Because earlier the discussion was, oh, why should I pay you? (laughs) So Hmm. we are definitely at a better stage now for sure maybe i'm being too optimistic but but yeah that's how i see it yeah interesting and and um i just wanted to go back to the first question when you started when you realized that you want to move from print to web like at least in your in your profile it's written that you went for a official course kind of a thing right you wanted to learn it formally so like oh, oh you mean my master's degree yeah, yeah. Oh, so that happened later, actually. Um, hmm. I worked in the industry for a couple of years. I saved up and then I went for my master's degree. So okay. I didn't mm-hmm. do it immediately after my graphic design course. <laughs> so um, okay. after my undergrad course at NID, I 
you know, worked in the industry for a couple of years. And then I think at that time, my younger sister decided to do her master's and I was like, wow, maybe even I should do one. And so it wasn't so planned that as it sounds, uh, you know, whenever we tell our story, we always want it to make sense. And obviously when I decided to do my master's, I did want to do it in digital because that's what I was practicing. And I felt like doing it in, you know, in a university may give me like extra benefits uh, and may help me in my career because I had already worked in a couple of places as a digital designer, though I don't think I was calling myself that. I think there were some different terms. And so obviously it was natural for me to want to do my master's in interactive media. So that's when I did that. And to be very honest, doing a master's degree abroad helps you for other reasons as well, like visas. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that you kind of feel like you need to check that box. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I checked the box. (laughs) Cool. So yeah, coming to the main topic of um, like the series is um, like, can you start by Telling when was the first time you hired, uh, what was the experience or was it tough to find a person? It was easy, like any, any, we can start there. Okay. I think initially I wasn't very self-aware about hiring. Like when I first started hiring, you know, you kind of get the headcount and then you just go ahead and do the interviews and you follow what the HR says and you follow the process. I think over time, obviously, and experience, you realize that maybe this process isn't the best to hire designers and then you start changing the process. I don't ever remember feeling that hiring was difficult. Mm -hmm. At the time that we were hiring, it was a very exciting time. The iPhone was out. We were designing apps for the iPhone. A lot of people were very excited to join our team You know, and what we were looking for were people who were truly interested and truly excited. I remember interviewing someone who was like, I've designed an app in my free time. And it was like in the app store. And we were like, this person is amazing. Let's hire them immediately. (laughs) So I wouldn't say we followed, we didn't follow proper process. I don't think, you know, we knew what a proper process was for hiring a designer. We just were like, okay, this person seems really interested they have the talent they have the potential let's bring them on board and that's how I started hiring obviously over the years as you gain experience then you start thinking about teams and team structure and who's the right person to like be a good value add for this kind of team versus some other team that you also have in your org and you start looking at like leaders and who is a potential leader and stuff like that. But at that in, initially, when you start hiring, at least for me, I wasn't thinking of that at all. I was just like, okay, they're a good, really good designer. Let's hire them. <laughs> so, yeah. And this was, you were at Source Bits in that time. Yeah. Like some amazing work came out of that period and especially that company. I have to give them a call yeah. out. Like I remember that one of the first apps was Nightstand, right? Yeah, yeah. it was an amazing yeah. team. Everyone was like insanely, insanely talented. Yeah. So it was just a great place to learn. And yeah, it just feels very natural mm-hmm. now. But when I look back, I think that was like the most amazing team I've ever been in in my whole life. And it's just not possible to find that again. <laughs> One of the people in our team actually, I think, went ahead and founded Sketch mm-hmm. and yeah, it's it's just crazy amounts of talent. Of course, we were doing UX in a very sort of traditional Mm. way at that time. And we were using OmniGraffle. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) it was an all Mac world, Uh, right? And SourceWits especially was very deep into Mac and iOS tech. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was super fun. I think uh, obviously a very different time, but super fun. A lot of amazing projects. And I think that's the first time I started working with actual products Mm -hmm. as well, like product founders and founders would hire us to make apps. And it was very exciting because you could like actually discuss with the founder. So is this really what you want to do? Like, what are your goals? And and then, and so design was more strategic and it was like less executional and 
um, that was very interesting as yeah. well. That was like, uh, people now call it the gold rush, but that was a period when so many people mm-hmm. suddenly came out and, you know, they found this platform which would let them be entrepreneurs, right? And the insane level of productivity, yeah. like the sheer amount of apps. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. <laughs> There's TwitPic yeah. as well. It's just so much stuff uh, came out of that time. And we we churned out insane numbers of apps yeah. as well. Like I think in a year, it was like 100 yeah. apps easily. Yeah. Wow. So we were like, I think as a team, we, it was almost like a factory. Yeah. In, in some way they're just like churning out apps and obviously some of them are good <laughs> you know when you're when you're doing that kind of level of productivity yeah. yeah cool so I wanted to get back into the first part of the thing that you said talk a little bit more mm. about the process right so obviously like from those days like the process must have been a bit fast as well as you said how has the process changed between then and now and could you give us like an overview of what does your hiring process uh, look like now? Oh, right now, very different. <laughs> <laughs> so I think hiring is different in different mm-hmm. companies. So I've done very different hiring processes in different companies. My approach today is, you know, you need to understand the company, the company culture, you know, the budget, where you're at, and and then you're, you're more planned. Um, in Shopify, we also have, what I really like, which is a double blind mm-hmm. uh, hiring process, which means that if there are five people in the interview panel, out of which one of them is the hiring manager, no one can see each other's feedback. Nice. So everyone mm-hmm. submits their feedback and puts the rating of like, yes, no, maybe strong, yes, strong, no, whatever. And there's a really nice feedback process and no one can see each other's feedback so there's lesser Mm -hmm. bias and even me as a hiring manager I can't see anyone's feedback until I've submitted my Mm -hmm. own and I feel like that's really fair because then at the end of the process everyone can see what we all submitted and then we have a discussion on and which what we call a recap where we discuss the candidate and we give them a fair chance so I think that's very interesting. Yep. I think otherwise it's pretty much the same. Like, you know, you do a portfolio review, you talk to the candidate, you ask them questions, depending on their seniority, there's one round, which is about like their leadership or their behavioral aspects. And then there's like the craft rounds, like portfolio, mm-hmm. and then like a whiteboarding exercise. I personally hate take home exercises. So wherever I go, I try to, delete it yeah. <laughs> from the system <laughs> luckily at shopify we have a whiteboarding exercise which is great and it's not a take home at referral candy we also uh started to do like a you know on-site mm-hmm. whiteboarding yeah. or collaborative design exercise so yeah so i totally great. feel the hate for take home assignment i never finish <laughs> yeah. my stuff on deadlines and when you have to make an impression that's really hard i would prefer you call me to your office for two days if you need and uh, seriously yeah yeah and uh i've i've done design tests like even last year not last year but maybe two mm-hmm. years ago and it's always so hard uh and i've been a designer for so long and i still find it so challenging and a pain a real pain and when you do the design test what often happens is that the people who are reviewing it have their own like yeah. standards right and they will never tell you <laughs> what the standards are or they don't maybe they don't do it on purpose but they haven't thought through it or they haven't had a discussion what their standards yeah. are so you could do anything and it you know even if your solution is good you could yeah. fail and so what my current view is is that when you do a design test you should just try to impress the team like don't try to do an actual Mm -hmm. like don't actually try to do it some Mm -hmm. sort of in-depth like actual exercise like just do some sexy designs and just put it there and make sure everything looks good (laughs) (laughs) so so that's my current learning on design tests i just remembered in clear trip we had both the tests so take home also was there and like a whiteboard exercise wow but i think but uh with um and the whiteboard exercise was hardly like 
15 20 minutes oh okay uh, that that small like it was not like an elaborate thing but uh, over the years i've figured out that the take home was not required for us the 15 minute is good enough because we really? just throw, yeah, yeah we just throw like the simplest problem on earth and uh, these days with with the new talent coming in they have like lot of energetic ideas and like dynamic uh, world views and what not and <laughs> i asked to like make like a like a simple alarm clock yeah or like how how would like a analog uh, watch work right very very simple but and, those and are the to, best questions to ask because you're testing like the basics yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and sometimes like i've seen like even if they themselves say that the okay the clock is simple it's quite dumb uh, does it have a uh, accelerometer <laughs> so they are dumb <laughs> <laughs> simple rakh de wow so, so it's, yeah, it's it's quite fun um, and and best is i don't have an answer for this also so it's just yeah. jamming there's it no is. Uh, i have yeah I really like in whiteboarding exercise I like to see the kind of questions they ask because you know we once had a candidate I think in Refro Candy we asked them to design a time machine mm-hmm. or something and there were some random constraints like you can go forward or backward in time and now I mean it's very similar to the yeah. alarm clock but a little difficult because you could tie yourself in knots <laughs> like in in the whole time machine scenario it's very interesting to see how people think like because one person was like so are the users i can talk to uh and you know so people come up with their own questions during the exercise which i enjoy and i think it's always fun to see how somebody think and how do they like approach the problem and i also like to see people who like actually sit down and think about it for 3 minutes and then you know start whiteboarding versus there are some people who just like start <laughs> so i mean both is fine like nothing is a wrong approach but it's always good you get to know more about the person i think that way sure yeah and cool. kedar i think we've skipped a step so we are already talking about uh, case studies and what not but we have to stop for a bit on the portfolio because i think that's where most of the candidates get screened in most company pipelines So, Aditi, what are some of the positive and negative signals of applicants right, that make you say "yeah" or "nah" to <laughs> you know to portfolios? Yeah, and especially when you said like make something sexy, which will impress. Now, like you have you know all the more required to answer this, please. <laughs> yeah, I think after seeing a lot of portfolios, my experience is that most portfolios are very mm-hmm. good mm-hmm. nowadays. Like everyone has. learned how to put their ui in cool looking devices and put it on a big white background and make it look cool but i think that now that's a requirement you have to do that and so if i see a portfolio who doesn't do that i'm like why didn't you do this basic task where you can get templates and do it in 5 mm-hmm. minutes right like so it doesn't require time anymore to make your screen look mm-hmm. good in a device So I do judge on like visual kind of finishing of your portfolio but then I also judge on like how they communicated their story and their mm-hmm. work not so much on like how cool the project was or whether it was some branded project I really mm-hmm. don't care um it's more about how do they talk about the work and how do they present the work and and one thing that I've seen is that some designers put like lots of text or they put like lots of information about the process like oh i did card sorting or oh i did wireframes like okay yeah cool but like what is it about this project that you want to present yeah. right like what was the impact what was the outcome so i do want to know how did this design actually result in something or is the result the design <laughs> so so i think it's it's about just testing like the level of the designer uh, of course it's different if you're hiring a junior designer and then you're just looking for potential like you're just looking for raw talent and you're just like oh my god this person seems to have a really good raw talent and then usually i think i need to speak to the person for at least 30 mm-hmm. minutes to like gauge their potential but especially if i'm hiring like a mid level or senior designer how you arrange your portfolio is a sign of your design yep. skills like what was the first page second page like have you thought about the other person who is going to read through your portfolio the user so, of the portfolio 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it is unfair though. Like I do see some like very good designers who may not have the time hmm. to create a polished portfolio, right? But I think if you are that person, then you should just say it. You should just say, hey, this is not the finished one. If you want to finish one, let yeah. me know, you know, and, and then we can give you the opportunity to send it. Yeah. So, so I, mm. I know it's fair to expect a certain level, but that's the industry now. And I don't even think I can meet that standard yeah, yeah. anymore. Like I don't have that level of visual design skill that is required today to become a senior designer. That's very interesting. So, and I think designers not finishing their portfolio is a meme subgenre in itself. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so that's, that's very true. Isn't it? mm. It's okay. I mean, you only need two to three projects is my view. That's all I look at. Like I'm not going to look at more mm. than that. I just look at two or three projects and that's it. And it also depends. Are you sending the portfolio to a recruiter? Then that's a disaster, mm. right? There are some recruiters who go through portfolio and make decisions. I mean, they don't know yep. anything. So they should never make any decision of like design skills. So obviously make sure your portfolio is going to the right person, is being seen by the right person. And it's okay. I mean, designers are always going to keep improving the portfolio forever. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I do also judge if a designer has a website sure, sure. or not. Yeah. That, that yeah. makes yeah. a difference. Yeah. yeah, and whether it's built on Wix or Squarespace, <laughs> that also uh, it's okay. uh, matters. It's okay, whatever. I, I yeah. don't no, it, it depends on the uh, <laughs> number of years of experience. And that was yeah. my like, next question, actually. Because a t- like, few years ago, I tried at Google. Hmm. And I went through the first round. But the second round was quite surprising for me. Because um, like I already had like 12 years of experience. And, yeah. and the questions were more towards, what do you think of the icons? And uh, what do you think? And we were talking about Google Maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at certain point, I had to just dismiss, not very abruptly, but just tell them, like, it's about problem solving. And I think that visual polish, I think I've passed that phase. Yes, I can do it still. But my kicks are, maybe I'm applying for a different position altogether. So keeping this background, are there any processes in Shopify to judge or to evaluate like a senior designer? So I think nowadays visual design is a requirement. I think even in Shopify, you know, that's why I was shocked when I passed the interview phase. I was like, oh my God, are you sure? Because I actually failed Facebook and the, I think I failed Facebook at like the sixth round and my feedback was that my visual design skills were not good enough. (laughs) I was like, okay, I agree. I take that feedback. So I think today in product design, you are expected to be what I would say full stack, Mm -hmm. which is really good visual design, really good strategic thinking, very good leadership and UX and everything else you can think of, a good presentation skills, blah, blah, blah. And I think what you need to do is kind of like how you frame your portfolio and your narrative to the best of your ability so that you can cover your weaknesses as much as you can and then go through. But even at Shopify, that expectation is there. There are content designers. So we have content designers and they can be very senior and they only, and they are kind of like olden days UX designers. Like they do IA, Mm. They do a lot of design projects. There are projects which have only content designer and no product designer, right? Because there's no real UI that needs to be done. There's no real visual stuff that needs to be done either. It's more like rearranging what already is there in a way that users can understand and doing a lot of strategic work as well. So, So we have content designers and we have researchers who can contribute strategically to design and be active in the UX process. But product designers have to be kind of full stack. Understand. It's it's harsh. It's harsh. Like I feel like, yeah, the industry standards are just going up and up. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Uh, Before we jump next, uh, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. 
Hey, everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast from Delhi Capitals, we have their manager, Siddharth Basin, and marketing head, Vaibhav Dar, discuss with Varun what Naid Delhi is all about and the life of players in the bio bubble. On Advertising is Dead, Varun talks to Masu Meenawala, luxury fashion influencer, about her focus on wanting to elevate women in business. On Simplified, Chuck, Tony, Naren, and Shriket are once again joined by Bertie to talk about his love for vinyl records. On Teddy Mere Raste, Kesho takes us to India's biggest man-made Lake Bhopal Tal. And on Smile India, Shifa tells us the story of Munisha from Mumbai who uses empty tetra packs to create durable furniture for schools. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our others for that matter, please do tell a friend. We really appreciate you spreading this. Word of mouth helps a lot. And finally, this week, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, CoinSwitch, Kuber, Slay Coffee, and Intel. We really appreciate the support. Okay, uh, welcome back to the show. So I would like to shift gears a bit and and move to a article which I was reading, which you had written. Oh. Uh, I think when you were in referral candy, that um, it's okay to switch jobs uh, <laughs> if you're not comfortable. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to just uh, dig further on that. Uh, like, would like to hear your thoughts around it because a lot of times it happens that when we see, at least I, when I see people uh, hopping jobs, um, I sometimes suspect <laughs> uh, stability, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so it would be great to hear the other side uh, that what, what, what is your thought process behind it? Yeah, I'm a bit extreme in my viewpoint. I would say I w- I'm very almost mercenary in that if you don't pay me how much I want, I will leave the company. Uh, this is really politically incorrect, I guess. No, not but at all. In my 20s, especially, I was just very, very focused. And I really was quite mercenary. And I was just like, These are, this is what I want to do. And I changed as many jobs as possible to get where I wanted to get. I don't put a lot of... I don't think that you should be loyal to your company after a certain mm-hmm. point. Right. Like you should learn whatever you want to learn and then move on. And if it's not working out, then move on. Right. And I, and I have seen a lot of designers and I encourage people to do that as well. Like, you know, if people talk to me, I'm like, if you're frustrated, why don't you look for other opportunities? Right. Or it could be the other way around as well. If you think you deserve a promotion, why don't you go out there and see who is going to pay you this amount that you think you deserve? And if you can get it, go get it, right? So maybe it's a bit mercenary, but I I also see it from the perspective of learning, which is I wanted to work in design studios. I wanted to work in consultancies. Then I wanted to work in startups. And then after that, I was like, okay, I've done a few startups. Now I want to try a bigger company. So I'm just like trying different things. And that's just my approach. It may not be the best approach for other people, right? Like I wouldn't say, oh, everyone should do this. Like (laughs) it's not fun. Uh, Changing companies a lot is not fun. And there are always people who are like, oh, why are you, you know, why are you changing? And I don't have any opinions on people who change a lot, but I do ask like, you know, what happened and, you know, did anything happen? Like what made you leave if you want to share like if you don't want to share that's fine and also the what like I speak to a lot of junior designers in the industry and I'm very aware of how many toxic team cultures exist out there and there's really no point staying and trying to make it work I mean you don't have much power to change things at like a designer level of an entire org like you know just go find another org that's better for you right so that's kind of how I see it I don't know whether that's a very extreme perspective but that's just how I've managed it and I also think that some people have this notion that your career is a ladder and you're just supposed to go from junior designer to mid-level designer to senior designer then you I don't know become you know creative director Or like, then you become head of design, then it's like finish. (laughs) Or like, I don't know what what people are imagining. But I actually think your career is kind of like a jungle gym where you're just like doing various shit. And you're just like, what is all this? And 
in hindsight, you put it together in a story and you say, hey, I did this and this and this. And it makes sense in hindsight. But when you're in it, it may not make sense, right? Mm -hmm. People need to be free to do whatever they want. And they shouldn't feel like, oh, I have to like get promoted. Uh, I can't move laterally to another Mm -hmm. role. Like what if there's a designer who actually wants to become a researcher? Let them go (laughs) and do that. Right. Thanks yeah. for saying that. Yeah. That that yeah. needed to be said, especially the bit <laughs> about careers. Like it's it's never a straight path. And I think yeah. I will also say this is a side effect of the industry being young, right? That we don't have insight. A lot of people who've had 30 year, 40 year careers, which is what an actual career looks yeah. like. So wherever we look at, we see these straight lines, right? So I think, yeah. Thanks for saying that again. Okay. Mm. No worries. In fact, I, I have this question for couple of illustrators in past episodes I'd asked like what does a 40 year old illustrator do wow like, does he or she still illustrate or like they have to move to a creative director an art director role oh. so yeah so it's interesting to yeah that perspective in if you fit in product design it also makes sense here so we have this at least in India I don't know much about the other parts of the world but at least in India you see a lot of designers positioning themselves or then trying like every every designer with five years experience has a mentor <laughs> next to it in LinkedIn right that's uh, so and, awesome and, <laughs> yeah and I think uh, it is because of a need to because they've joined somewhere and they want to hire people yeah uh, they want to build a team so so it's it's quite obvious that you write these uh, heavy words around it right um, so what what is your take on being like a brand yourself uh, you? to uh, no no I, and the reason i'm asking is because this this connects to the stability part right so if you're just moving from one company you're not so there's a flip side to it also right yeah where, where you have not gone deep enough into the problem uh, the problem of the company or for like problem of the user and then uh, made some value add through design and then uh, i don't know you can completely dismiss this question but this is the the other side which I'm coming from, and then you automatically become a brand. So I mm. look up to say Abhinit, who's who's been struggling and trying to do something in Indonesia, <laughs> or or Srinath, uh, who's who's trying to do in the food tech space, right? Yeah. And and these becomes automatically if you see good product, they they are automatically brands themselves. Yeah, yeah. So no, I any, I any thoughts on that? I think stability is important, you know, and I think if you are a leader it's different and you have to be responsible and you have to care about the stability of the team and how it grows. However, if you are just a designer on the team, it's okay to keep changing jobs. I mean, I don't think anyone should feel guilty and feel like them leaving the team is going to make the team unstable. Mm -hmm. Like you are replaceable, right? Uh, Even as a leader, you are replaceable. Uh, At least that's what I think. And so I think sometimes we may overvalue that to some degree. I do agree that if you stay longer in a company, you can do more, you can build more bridges, you can gain more trust and do more things. So the longer you stay, the more you can do, right? And that's awesome, right? And and I think I totally see the value of that for sure. So if you're having fun, in the company, you should definitely stay and you should definitely do um, as much as you can. Sorry, I forgot the other part of the question. I only answered the stability part. No, so so you become brand uh, oh, yourself. The brand and that's why, yeah, yeah. And I'm not really like harping on the brand aspect of it, but generally you are stable enough. And this is coming from my most recent interview. Uh, one of the candidates uh, I was interviewing, mm. he asked me, either you are like whatever, VP at or EVP at Book My Show and you left in two years. Okay. Uh, can you tell me why? And I was like, <laughs> Are you? <laughs> yeah, and I, and I was like, yeah, good, good one. So I explained him, but like there are designers who are also trusting or judging which leader they are reporting to or which team they are getting oh. into, right? Um, that, that perspective. I think if, I, I, I find it hard to believe that people judge people based on how long they've been in a company. <laughs> like, I've definitely built, at least in my view, you know, a good network of people that I really trust uh, in the design community. And they're all very aware of, of like stuff that I do and that I can do random stuff. 
but I always like explain myself when I say, you know, I got excited about this other opportunity. And so I did it. Like, I think it depends how you leave and it depends, especially if you're in a leadership position, does your team still love you when you leave (laughs) or like at least they can tolerate you I don't know and so I think it's about people like building that connection with people so they know what you are about I think being authentic is important and how I don't really see myself or want to be any kind of brand that puts a lot of pressure I think on a person as well like because then you have to do this like social media presence and and I really respect people who do that like I'm like wow you have all this energy and time to do it I just I'm too tired at the end of the week to do all (laughs) of this stuff but I think if you're authentic and you always say the kind of things that you say then you get an automatic following in a way like people will come to you when they want a particular kind Mm. of thing like for me for example people have heard me being very outspoken and so a lot of people come to me to ask me hey have you heard anything about this company or that company what do you think of this Um, and they know I'm going to tell them Mm. what I know and Mm. I'm not just going to be super diplomatic (laughs) so and I don't know if that's a brand but at least that's my sort of authentic voice, right? And people come to me and say, tell me about my portfolio. And I'm like, you know, it's going to be harsh. Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> so, and they're like, yes, let's do this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so as long as you know what kind of agenda, almost like an agenda, like what is your one-liner that you want to tell the design community? I think that's fine. I wouldn't want my brand to be connected with my employer Uh if that makes sense Mm. like I want to be yeah Yeah. my own individual and yeah my employer is awesome Shopify is an amazing company but but I'm my own person as well so that's kind of how I see it if I do build a brand it would not be connected to Mm. which company I work at or like yep Oh. Just take design, right? Like, makes makes a lot of sense of. actually because I also get this question, Kedar, sometimes, right? Like, and I encourage people to build their brands, but I all almost always tell them this: remember what your brand is selling, also, because a brand without a product behind it is kind of pointless, right? So when you build a personal brand, mm-hmm. you're kind of looking for that next gig for that next challenge you're putting yourself out there so that you could network better right so people do it for various reasons but be sure of why right like why are you doing this why are you putting in this much time and yeah yeah and and like are you out there because you're saying oh I'm a very cool designer who's worked in the industry for 20 years okay yeah you know but there (laughs) should be something else you know that you want to say and which will make somebody interested in joining your team. Because in the end, it is about that, right? Like the kind of things that I talk about, I hope that people feel like, oh, okay, if I join a company, then they know that it's going to be, you know, not biased, Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. toxic, that I wouldn't tolerate those things. And there's a sort of guarantee that comes with that. So, So I think that's valuable. And then somebody else may have something else that is valuable to them and then they are like you know getting their own network of people out of that makes sense i want to pick on that yeah (laughs) next Mm -hmm. thing i want to ask is uh, just picking on that you know uh, you've mentioned it a couple of times now right like there are a lot of places out there who have a very toxic environment you've said that designers should not hesitate at all right to leave those or feel guilty about it but what are some of the things you picked up over the years which you know ensure that your team or you know the place that where, where you're going uh, it doesn't end up becoming a toxic environment right uh, one of the things that people have been talking about a lot is how you know the teams that you build should be diverse right and i think especially important for design having multiple perspectives there any thoughts on that these two things oh. Like, how do you avoid toxicity? And second is, like, does building a diverse environment help counter that to some extent? I think it's two Mm -hmm. different things. Uh, You can have a toxic culture anyway. It doesn't automatically solve all your problems. 
I would actually frame it slightly differently. Like I would say that there are normal teams and then there are not diverse mm-hmm. teams. Sure. And it takes a lot of effort to have a team that's not diverse. Mm-hmm. That's that's my view. There, it's it's a system, you know, it could be happening unintentionally, but in today's day and age, it's it's really hard to make excuses. Mm-hmm. I I think that's my view. It's, if you put in, it's a solved problem and as well, like lots of people have normal teams and they have no problem having a non-diverse team. So if you have a non-diverse team, you need to think about what happened Mm -hmm. and why is your org or your company creating this situation and how to solve it. And again, this has all been solved. There are lots of examples out there of like processes to Mm -hmm. follow In terms of toxic, I think, you know, we shouldn't blame ourselves for being in a toxic Mm -hmm. team if that has happened to someone. I've heard so many stories. In my view, in the stories that I've heard from startup startup land, right now I'm far away from startup land because I'm in a huge org called Shopify and everything is awesome. And we actually have a four day week from next month. That sounds awesome. So yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm like in the opposite of a toxic environment. Uh, But what I've heard a lot is it does come from founders. Mm -hmm. The founders do create a certain culture or tone of voice that trickles down. And when it trickles down, it sometimes gets exaggerated. And then, you know, it creates a company culture, which could be Mm -hmm. toxic, or it could be some other leader that is creating the toxic culture. It's never just some guy (laughs) <laughs> creating the toxic it's always somebody very senior and it's happening okay so thinking that you can suddenly change that through your own actions is quite a lot of hubris and i mean you can go <laughs> for it you know if you want i would say wow like i think some people are you know very young and very energetic i don't have the energy for this so i would just say you know bring it up with the team, like discuss it in your retros, but if it's not changing and if it's making you a wreck and if you're working on the weekends, then yeah, then you should look at other places because you can do a lot of good work without being in a toxic culture. So also I think in terms of what is toxic, Mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes maybe people use that word too easily. So I would like to define that a little bit, if that's okay. Like, I think toxic would be, you know, people are making you work through the weekend, you know, people are shouting and screaming in the office, people are being really mean. There are weird things, like really toxic. That's when I say toxic, I mean toxic, toxic. (laughs) right? Like there is nobody in the company who has children because if you have children, you can't work yeah. there because <laughs> the work hours are so crazy, right? That's all sign that you're working in a not so great company. Sure. Yeah, I think that helps. I, I do think that, you know, the words get thrown around a bit loosely and then they start, you know, to kind of lose their meaning. So thanks for defining it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even yeah. I was going to ask because the, like every designer or every person will have a different threshold yes. to to define yeah yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah definitely I mean I think you know maybe my definitions may be also a bit old school which is like obviously you know like I was uh, working I don't think I should say this but there was you know I've seen people like throw things in the office yeah. not in any actual company that I work at but as a freelancer yep yeah. Obviously, this is not okay and this is toxic. Shouting is also bad. And overwork, I think, is the most common thing that I've seen. Like just putting a lot of pressure on your team, expecting people to work 16 hours a day. I used to think it's normal. Oh, I used to think it's normal as well. And I think those uh, 100 apps a year days couldn't have happened without 16 hour (laughs) days. I was, to be very fair, I was having fun and I thought it was normal then I came to Singapore actually I was still working 16 hour days like throughout my career and then I came to Singapore and I had my first boss Dinesh who's the founder of Referral Candy and he looked at me and he's like go home (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I was like, what? It's 6 p.m. He's like, go home. <laughs> and he taught me that if you work long hours, your team will be impacted and they may feel like they have to do the same thing. And I was like, I don't expect them to do that. But they're like, he was like, that's what they expect. So you need to put, you need to be a good role model and you need to finish your work on time and then go home. So I was like, this Singapore is a very interesting place. <laughs> so I definitely like learned a lot of things here. And, and I think it was very interesting to me to find out that you can finish your work in eight hours and be as productive as before. You don't lose productivity. That's a very hard thing to come to terms with. At least for me, it was really hard, right? Like, when I switched <laughs> gears and then because you look back and you were like okay I was wasting a lot of time back then right <laughs> yeah. technically yes yeah. yes <laughs> you're doing chai yeah. breaks smoke breaks whatever yeah because know, whatever yeah, it does. doesn't matter <laughs> you're going back home at 11 p.m at 1 a.m so like time time kind yeah. of becomes flexible yeah makes sense yeah in fact I had thought of taking like a TCS kind of job when I'll turn 35 Wow. Uh, was was my dream when I was 28, <laughs> 25, when I was just slogging in like advertising agency and just getting hang around uh, product design and like everything. And I said 35. <laughs> and the irony is uh, I'm 38 and I've just joined a startup. <laughs> oh, wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Cool. So there's one thing I picked, Aditi, in, in your answers. Um, mm. At one point, you were talking about how, you know, the bar is getting higher in the industry. You need to know this and that and everything. And at the same time, you mentioned for one of the questions that hiring has not been a challenge, right? So I was just wondering, like, uh, have, have you been oh. exceptionally lucky with finding these people who are, you know, I think um, that's a great question. I, I think initially when I started mm. hiring, it didn't feel challenging. Mm. Um, obviously now when, you know, I'm trying to do hiring the right way and I'm trying to, you know, interview people remotely across various countries and building teams and finding the right people for the mm. right teams. Now it is obviously very, very challenging. But initially when I didn't know what I was doing and I was not self-aware, it felt easy because you're just hiring like people with a lot of mm. talent. I think today it's definitely very hard. There's a lot of competition as well. Maybe that's why it's also much harder right now. Like there's always another company with a better offer or, you know. <laughs> so there's always going to be that uh, challenge as well. Kedar, over to you. Yeah, I would like to conclude uh, with one last question, which was um, you have worked in like a technical or whatever, like a geeky kind of a product, which was Postman. Yeah. And you've done some like amazing job with it and like an API based company. So Thank any, you. any, yeah, any comments you want to give to young designers who are starting fresh uh, on the lines of obviously design is about solving problems. It's not like you, because we are again looking at a trend of people not uh, people wanting to work in the B two C space and uh, like not working on SaaS products or right. other places. So any any uh, first of all, if if you have seen that pattern, um, I know you are on the other spectrum in Singapore, but yeah, you must have seen some pattern there as well. And um, any any thoughts around? Yeah. This? I, I've definitely seen that. Like, I think as there are more and more opportunities, designers are looking for what I call the new, the next shiny object. They're like, they're like, oh, this company got $3 billion in funding. So I'm going to join them. Uh, and I always say, okay, cool. Um, but, you know, what about what you want to do, right? Like, are you just looking for that star, you know, to stick on your fridge? Or yeah, I don't know yeah. what. Uh, but instead, you should look for the exciting design work that you want to do and then do that. Um, and also, because, I mean, my postman opportunity was so random. Like, you know, I met these folks and I was like, this is so interesting. This is so challenging. I really want to do the work. I would have never known that it got famous and, you know, it went off. And And so I think I would tell designers, look for the thing that you want to do. Don't just join what you think is a cool company because today companies crash and burn 
right? Faster than ever. So look for something that you think is truly genuine and interesting and solving a real problem. And, and that's the way, you know, to become a better designer. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, uh, Aditi. It was really fun talking to you. A lot of uh, different perspectives uh, and a lot of food for thought in general to to think on for designers especially. Sure. Happy to uh, chat with both of you. Yeah. It was a good I'll conversation. Have, thank you uh, for people also to listening till the end. Currently, I'm heading the design at Jupiter uh, dot money, and we are hiring at all levels. So you can visit Jupiter dot money slash careers. And follow AudioGAN on Instagram uh, at AudioGAN Moments or visit AudioGAN.com for more GAN sessions. You guys want to plug anything? Shopify is hiring. Gojek is hiring. Yeah, we are definitely hiring. Shopify is hiring senior designers and content designers. Okay. And Gojek also hires from time to time. If you want to know about the job <laughs> openings, you can follow us on Twitter at, at Gojek Design. And yeah, we'll post all the updates there. Awesome. Hello, thank you guys. Uh, thank you. It was fun talking to you. And uh, thank you, Aditi, for like, um, I know you have, it's it's like quite out of your schedule time. Yes, and it's midnight. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're in Singapore. <laughs> and that's it from today's GAN session. For show notes and more GAN, visit audiogan.com. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to check our other interesting podcast on IVM Network. You can listen to us on IVM Podcast app ivmpodcast.com or any of your favorite podcasting apps. To stay tuned, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at IVM Podcast. And if you wish to connect with me, I am at AudioGAN Moments on Instagram. Until then, take care. Are you looking for finance products and services that can enhance your personal finance experience? Are you looking for a space to talk about your financial product or service? And are you looking for a crisp talk show where the conversation is all about money? Well, your search ends here. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta and I'm host of the Pesa Pesa podcast. And I invite you for the conversation about your personal finance on each Monday on the IVM podcast app or the website or on any podcast streaming platforms. See you folks. Habits, routines, how exactly do they help us get better? Well, to simplify it for you, tune in to the Habit Coach Podcast. I am Ashton Doctor and I'm going to be here to help you get better daily with some simple, easy to do habits that you can easily adapt to your life. So tune in to the Habit Coach Podcast from Monday to Friday because I believe that awesome lives start with awesome habits.